How about you? I am also doing well. Um, congratulations on your, your new appointment. Thank you very much. Mm. Do you still retain your old one, which is also in the academia? No, I. Okay. I, I no longer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Congratulations once again, and thank you for speaking to us. Um, have you had a, uh, the benefit of reading the decision of a court? Yes, I did. I, I read the decision yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, I think that the decision is, is a good one. It's a good one in the sense that the key issue which was in contention had to do with a prayer on the, I mean, to the judge to ask his wife, um, declare a mistrial and, uh, and end the, the case. But the judge understood the prayer. In fact, when you read the judgment, you would, the ruling, you would see that the judge even cited foreign authorities on the circumstances under which a mistrial will be declared. And she did admit that in other jurisdictions, this would have led to a mistrial. She also admitted to Ghana law on mistrial. And her research, as indicated in the judgment, showed that a situation where the misconduct of a procedure will lead to a mistrial does not exist expressly under our law, our criminal law, which I think is the correct conclusion. And I know the applicants, that is a lawyer for that this person, were also aware of that. Their prayer, however, was for the judge to see the reason in other jurisdictions declaring his trial based on the misconduct of prosecutors so that we could do that in Ghana or more or less establish that principle in Ghana. The accused person's argument is a solid one. The accused person's lawyer's argument is a solid one. And indeed, our constitution provides for administrative officials, you know, like the attorney general, like prosecutors, any state, you know, anyone who is in public office, to act, you know, in a fair Handed, legal, and reasonable manner, which is found in Article 23. The question, the difficulty with which the judge faced, however, was whether she has a jurisdiction to, you know, read into 23 a misconduct of, of, a, 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 of a prosecutor and based on that to terminate the trial. I think, and I mean, I mean, that is my personal view from where I think as, 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 a, as a lawyer. I think first you reading into Article 23 can be done. But I doubt it will be done by a high court. Because the Constitution doesn't allow any other person to do such a thing apart from the Supreme Court. So, to my mind, it is a question of interpretation whether reading Article 23 and the, the behavior of the prosecutor, in this case, Attorney General, could, you know, be used as a ground for declaring a mistrial. And I think it's a question which only the Supreme Court could answer because it will involve an interpretation of the Constitution. So the high court has, you know, every, I mean, I think has a good, the judge has a good reason to not venture into that because even if she did, she would have ended up doing some interpretation of Article 23 or of the Constitution. And when she did that, chances are that it may be, you know, first when an application is made to the Supreme Court to, to do so. 
and the Supreme Court will crush it, not, not because the judge's conclusion is right on the merit of the case or not, but will crush it merely because the judge doesn't have the jurisdiction to do such interpretation or reading into the into the position. So, when I read the judgment, I discovered that that was the main problem with, 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 with that was the main challenge the judge had me really, I mean, from the angle I saw it, and I think I, I really say he really didn't have that jurisdiction to do that. Now, uh, now, what are the options? Uh, and I know um, the team for that you said, so that's a very strong team of serious uh, minded lawyers who have extremely deep knowledge in, in the law. You know, so I have no doubt in my mind that their next line of action uh, would be something that would uh, uh, lead to, uh, 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 would bring this matter to its uh, logical conclusion. In fact, I'm looking at Article 23 that you talked about. Yeah. Um, the closing portion says, um, and persons aggrieved by the exercise of such active decisions shall have the right to seek redress before a court yeah. or the tribunal. The high court. The high court. And, but yeah. you're still suggesting that because a court or a tribunal, and you are saying if it is the high court, then why does it still have to go to the Supreme Court? Yeah, so uh, if you read the other part of the Constitution, so what the high court is, uh, if you look at the, the, the marginal note, Right of the 23 in just way, it is called enforcement of fundamental human rights. It is about enforcement of the human rights, but the question which is put to the judge would have to do with some kind of interpretation. And so, when you read the other parts of the constitution, interpretation could be done only by the Supreme Court, not the High Court. So, if there was an already existing interpretation, then the High Court will just enforce it under the 20, under 23 days. I mean, uh, sorry, so 23 is administrative judge, but when you go to 33 one, 33 one, it talks about, uh, that it says High Court. You know, so, so 23 and 33 one combine the High Court. But if you read further into the Constitution, I think um, Article 130, 131 and 2, the provision there does not allow the High Court to interpret the Constitution. But what the judge needed to do first was to interpret some 23 if, if it has the power to, to do what... Um, uh, and it happens in, in such situations, in such situations, the, the command, if there's a need for interpretation, the command would have been that you stay the proceedings and refer the matter to the Supreme Court for it to be done. Uh, but um, not every judge, uh, you know, is interested in in in, in same proceedings, and and so I think the, the case is still right. I mean, there is still uh, the point. The, the good thing about what has happened is that it is opening up. I mean, the the lawyers for the key persons are um, exceptionally opening up a conversation for a possible you know, landmark case to, to do what other jurisdictions do. Because the truth of the matter is that uh, that, that alleged allegation against the Attorney General is, is something that, like the judge ended up saying, would affect the, the trial, would affect the, 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 the fairness, and the quality of the judiciary, not just in this case, but also in other cases. Like they just said, people should not have an impression that a case before a court will be decided outside the court by some people, you know, which is what the allegation is about. Substantially, the allegation is that instead of you to come to court and do your work, you are trying to do the work at home and then bring the results to court, you know. And the judge correctly stated that that, that 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 should not be allowed and from that statement if you if you if you look at that statement you could see that if the judge had the jurisdiction to do what you know if she considered herself 
as having the jurisdiction to do what uh, the uh, at least person prayed him to do, the direction would have been, you would have seen that the direction would have been to, you know, possibly, you know, uh, and, and that's what he said, that at this point, it, it is advisable, you know, for the attorney general to, to retrieve himself or to, to step out and to take him, to remove himself from the, the case. Uh, and that is an indication that the judge probably doesn't find that very encouraging that uh, the attorney general will continue to be conducting the case personally, you, you, you know. And I'll come to the decision he has made on that because it could communicate that I was just playing it. But before that, this is um one of my listeners, Mark Sandy, who mm -hmm. says, and he says, Do you remember the case of Trump when his attorney attorney wanted the district attorney to recuse herself because she was having an affair with her prosecutor? How come we'll have no provisions for mistrial or conduct like this, how it should be handled? Uh, that a judge in the high court can rely on and make a decision when it involves a prosecution that could lead to somebody being jailed. Yes, so so that is a very a very important question, and this is the answer. You see, every country's laws develop based on needs that have arisen in the past. So let me give you an example. We have a law which said that. Part of the constitution, there's a provision in the constitution which said that the president of the republic, you know, shall not be the head or chancellor of any university. No other country in the world has that kind of provision. The reason is that we had a history of the president of Ghana being the automatic chancellor to all public universities, and that affected right from the colonial days. To, to run it, and that affected academic freedom. So when we're drafting the 1992 constitution, the framers thought it was to put that provision there to stop the practice. Now, the Americans have had this experience that we are now having for the first time. They have gone through it over and over again. So it helped them to what? To develop laws to safeguard that. We are, uh, I think, for the first time, at least it has been detected for the first time. And that is why I think that this issue, this, is, this issue is not even about uh, the current attorney general alone. It's not even about these accused persons. It's not even about this case, as far as my, my, my mind is concerned. I think it's an opportunity, a golden opportunity being given to us to also correct or fill in that gap that the, the person who tested is, 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 is pointing to. And that is why I don't think that the matter should just end with this application. I believe that even within the court system, it could go up further for the Supreme Court to make a pronouncement on that. And beyond that, Parliament should also, you know, look at this matter, investigate it, and come to the bottom of it so that laws will be made to fill the gap. And if we have a proactive president who obviously who is willing in to willing to solve this problem by now there should be serious discussions about setting up a kind of a commission of inquiry to investigate and make you know uh, fill in this gap so it is a golden opportunity if you, if you ask me that is how i see this thing and it should be taken we should take advantage of it to to, to address the concern the person who takes it you know, me. And um, one other comment that has come in, and I guess you understand this better, um, is from Dennis Yaquete, who says, given the seriousness of the alleged misconduct by the age just lamented by many law experts and public revulsion, the judge should have been guided by Lord Dennis' profound ruling on the question of precedence when he said that there must always be a first instance and the court cannot overlook the serious issues before it, only on the basis of no precedence. What do you say? Yes, I, I understand the concern that the sector is seeking to address. But I'm, I am a, 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 my philosophy is for judges to remain within their jurisdiction. I don't 
I don't subscribe to judicial activism because it could be dangerous. You know, so Lord Dennis' view is one of judicial activism. He's calling on judges to, stop, to find any means possible to solve what they think is a problem. But that could also go wrong. And we have seen that in a number of cases. I recall when the William A. issue was uh, going on, there was an application by uh, Mr. Martin Amiri to have to, to enforce the judgment which he had obtained earlier from the Supreme Court. And the question was whether a private person could enforce, could bring a case to court to enforce, you know, a, 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 a decision of the court on behalf of the Attorney General. And because at the time, I'm, I'm, Mr. Amiri believed that the Attorney General was unwilling to enforce the judgment. The case went to a single, you know, high court, a Supreme Court judge. Uh, it was the previous, from, uh, the former chief justice, Emi Yeboa, who was the one who sat on the case. He, 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 he assumed jurisdiction to interpret the constitution, which jurisdiction he did not have, and gave a meaning which he did not have the power to do. And that carried. I had a... Uh, so the difficulty of critiquing what he did in an article which I published, you know, because I, I don't subscribe to the idea that a judge should use his sense of what is just to do to apply the law. A judge should work within jurisdiction. So if the judge believes that I do not have jurisdiction, he should not go further to exercise the jurisdiction because he feels that something must be done. That is so. That is the challenge I have with the proposition that when a judge sees a problem, he should just use any means possible because that could also occasion injustice. And it has in previous situations occasion serious injustice to people. You know, in any case, if the judge did that, I believe uh, he would have been pushed anyway. And we'll come back to what uh, square one. <laughs> Now, let me conclude with you then by asking you, the AG says he's not going anywhere. He'll continue to be in the case. Good decision? Uh, <laughs> you know, I would, I would, I would not uh, excite uh, my judgment. I will not replace the AG's judgment with mine. Um, because uh, I mean, if we, if, if we want to put ourselves in the AGC, probably would have asked recently, probably there are so many things we wouldn't have done, which he has done, and probably would have even done things that he wouldn't have done. So uh, let me just leave that to your uh, distinguished listeners, and I believe they, they have the uh, capacity to, to discern and, and, and make a judgment of the AGC uh, position for themselves. But I would I would I would think that the judge was very courageous in in giving the advice she, she gave, uh, and I think that is a very significant advice that the judge gave. That don't don't do what don't don't continue. But then there is another question which uh, if the AG steps out personally. Okay, and, I, and I'm trying to second guess the Attorney General to choose, uh, you know, to take the advice. If the AG steps out, says, you know, remove himself from the case, can we even say that he has actually removed himself from, from the case when he's still in the office? You know, because any other person who comes is, is, is holding his brief. Any other person who takes over from him is basically doing uh, AG's work. So, uh, so I can understand why he cannot accept that advice because doing that would also mean that then he does to, to for the case to continue he probably doesn't even have to be continue to hold the the office because there is only there's only one attorney general any other person is just doing what attorney general has directed him to do you know so I can understand why the attorney general will be quickly reluctant to uh, take that advice. Mm. And, and that was the question I was coming to because I was coming to point to Article 88 uh, <laughs> 3 because it says the Attorney General shall be responsible for the initiation and conduct of all prosecutions exactly. 
of criminal offenses. So if he is to do what the judge is asking him properly, basically the judge is saying resign. Yeah, that is basically what it would mean, you know. And to understand why the AG would not accept the advice, you know, because if he's accepted the advice, he can't accept it halfway. He has to go the full, you know, uh, length, you know. Doc, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, my brother. Mm. Have a pleasure. Day. That's uh, Dr. Justice Remsai. Uh, now uh, uh, at the University of Ghana Law School. He's also a, a, a private legal practitioner. You see him at the court often. He's mostly there, most of the times there. One person who claims he's a lawyer that I've never seen in court, he will claim that he have never been to his court before.